Hey guys, welcome, welcome back to uh, the Rockhound site, Caver 461. Uh, I know it's been a while, but I'm starting to feel with, uh, with the changing weather and things warming up a bit, starting to feel the urge to uh, get into the Rockhound world a little bit more. So I think today uh, it is too chilly still, like there's too much snow around and so forth to actually do any rock hounding, but I'd like to speak to you briefly about um, the spectroscope and its, uh, its advantages in terms of identifying uh, mineral finds that you might have or actually cut gemstones that you may have purchased. So the difference between the spectroscope, uh, there we go, here's a little handheld tiny spectroscope, the diffraction spectroscope in this particular case, and the refractometer. This is your standard little gem refractometer that I typically would use. Um, the difference between the two is this particular refractometer, it measures the uh, change in speed or angle as light passes uh, through from one medium of certain density to another, maybe being the stone. It measures that change in angle in the, in the actual light, light ray. So the spectroscope, on the other hand, it's measuring um, the absorption or emission of light rays. Uh, the spectroscope, it's quick, it's handy, you can carry it around, you can use it in the field. Um, I have a little kit that I carry with me that allows me to make field identification, uh, which I, I really cannot do with the refractometer. The refractometer is somewhat limited in that uh, you need a smooth surface, which is not generally present in a rough stone. So when we're talking about um, absorption and emission spectrum, I suppose it's, it's quite important to understand, you know, a little bit about a light ray. Call that a light ray. It's white light. Notice the marker's white. This white light is actually not a single color, the color white. That doesn't exist. What it really is, is you could take that white, white, uh, white light and you'll notice it's actually comprised of a whole multitude of colors. So what happens is with the absorption spectrum is that certain parts, certain colors are absorbed. In other words, the transition element uh, cancels out that particular color. So let's say we're talking about um, iron within, within a certain stone. So the iron spectrum appearing to cancel out the green. Oh, there goes the green. Green falls out. And what we're left with is these remaining colors here. So really the color that then exists, say for example in the case of a sapphire um, where we've got the iron, uh, in, as a transition element within the sapphire, what's now left is only these colors making it through the stone. And it is a combination of these colors, or the sapphire, excuse me, it's lovely blue color, it's cashmere blue, right, amongst other things, right? So it's really by subtracting colors and wavelengths from the white light that you end up by default with the color that then exists. So that's how you're seeing the color of the stone. And then your ability to go in using the diffraction or uh, prism spectroscope to actually look at what those colors are that are being removed, what those wavelengths are, that is telling you, it's a signature pattern that tells you very clearly what kind of uh, stone. Um, many, many years ago when I was doing my um, gem, uh, gem exams, my instructor at the time at the uh, Toronto um, CGA labs, Richard Cartier, uh, he used to refer to that particular pattern that you would see on the spectrum as the old friend. As soon as you saw it, just immediately comfortably you knew what exactly you were looking at. You started to recognize that patterns of bands, lines, and uh, sometimes the, uh, the emission spectrum, in other words, the, the bright, bright, uh, bright fluorescent lighting, um, you'd recognize that pattern like an old friend, just suddenly, oh yeah, there's an elmandine garnet, or oh hey, there's there's a ruby. I can see that a mile off. Okay, it's not a spinel. It's quite obviously a ruby, based on that. Even though maybe a spin spinel and ruby are the same color, right? Uh, both of them have the red. And what is it? Well, 
there's that pattern of lines that tells me very clearly what this is. Now I mentioned also that you can have an emission spectrum. What that is, is looking at the, um, at the atomic level of the uh, light ray comes in. If you imagine there's your nucleus of the cell and around it are orbitals of electrons. So sometimes as the light comes in, it's extra energy. It'll take an electron and it'll bump it to a higher orbital. All these electrons are moving around in almost like consecutive shells from the nucleus outwards, right? Two electrons in the first, eight in the second, so on and so on. It takes one of those electrons, bumps it to a higher orbital, just temporarily. And then when that electron returns back to its original orbital, it gives off energy. And as it gives off the energy, that is what we call the emission spectrum. And so in the ruby, you're gonna see emission lines in the red. And it's so strong in a spinel that they actually call them um, organ pipes, right? These thick, thick fluorescent lines in the red of the spectrum that you will see in the spectroscope. So I guess uh, first question, how do we actually get down to uh, conducting this uh, examination? With okay. the... What we're looking at here are the various items that you need in order to conduct an examination of a stone and its absorption spectrum. You've got a bright light, the mag light. You've got these ends of chairs through which I've drilled little holes and put notches on the side. Your spectroscope sits in the notch, the stone sits on top of the hole, and that sits on top of your mag light. You fit that onto the mag light, it fits perfectly on top of the mag light. On top of that, you're going to put your gemstone. Now the whole idea is that the gemstone needs to be balanced on top in such a way that light takes the longest path possible through the stone and shines out into your spectroscope. So that's basically how you're doing it. You've got to hold it with one hand. You can see the white light on the tip of my finger there. That's the path that the light is taking through the stone. You want to align your spectroscope with that really white light. I just can't do it because I'm holding the camera right now. But basically you're going to be looking down that path of light. And the idea is to bounce the light from the mag light up through the hole, in through a pavilion of the stone, onto its table, bounce it back from the table, out through the pavilion again. And that's the longest path you can make, right? And you've got to just twist your gem around on the top there of your little knob until you can get it to that point with the white light. A couple of tricks with the spectroscope. Your light, your, your eye can actually see patterns much better when they're horizontal as opposed to vertical. I have a habit of liking to have my red at the, at the right hand side of my vision. But in reality, your eye will see a faint banding much better if you rotate the spectroscope 90 degrees. So that's one trick you'd want to use. Another thing is if you use the corner, the peripheral vision, you're able to see those faint bands a lot more strongly. So just a couple of little tricks there. You've got to have that good long path of light. The light must be very bright and you must be able to discern the very faint banding of the spectrum representing the um, light, light, uh, the light waves that have been removed from the light that is returning to your eye. So the, um, the strongest of these transition elements, the, the ones that give the biggest, boldest signatures are iron, chromium, and manganese. Those are the, those are the biggies, chromium especially in my opinion. Now we have here um, almondine garnet. You can see there's a faceted almondine there and you've got some rough almondine there, right? There's your rough almondine garnet, just kind of lumps. That's not the kind of stuff that you're going to be able to put onto a refractometer. You could definitely put the cut version onto a refractometer, but no way with that. So the almondine garnet gives a really good um, uh, iron spectrum. Uh, the peridot for sure, aquamarine, green tor. I mean, there's your peridot there. Um, I mean, again, right? This is kind of stuff you can very easily put um, onto the um, spectroscope. And it gives you a lovely, bold spectrum that immediately tells you, hey, I'm looking at a peridot, right? And that's thanks to the iron. Uh, same thing that's tinting the, the red of the almondine. Iron will generally show itself um, within the blue and green of the spectrum. Um, distinctive bands depending on which uh, gem material it's being seen. Ruby, spinel, emerald, 
they're all tinted by chromium. The chromium colors, or at least the, the colors on the actual gemstones tinted by chromium, are far more intense. Like the emerald is just this fluorescent green. Uh, the ruby, just this unbelievably vivid red. It's because the lines within the, um, the actual absorption spectrum are much more sharply defined than, say, within iron. Iron is almost a bit of a blur. The absorption spectrum of the chromium is sharp 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 you've also got emission lines remember i spoke about emission right so you'll find uh, often parallel bands in the blue you'll find uh, uh, bands in the violet in the green and in the yellow for the chromium but again each gemstone having its very specific absorption spectrum that you will come to recognize as an old friend manganese spectrum you'll see it in the pink tourmaline and something that I find really really cool is the um, the rare earth spectrum and uh, I have a particular stone here uh, which I've probably shown before but basically what it is it's it's appetite of a very unbelievably transparent appearance that I found at the Gibson property in uh, just outside Torrey Hill one of my favorite uh, rock counting locations and when I look at this for spectrum, I see the didymium spectrum. In other words, it's really a, a spectrum composed of two different rare earth elements, neodymium and praseodymium. Usually it's very faint, faint lines. That's how you often see the, um, the rare earth spectrums in, in the yellow for, for appetite. In this case, it is an intensely dark, dark um, band. So that's telling me that the rare earths are absolutely dominating this particular crystal kind of cool uh, you'll also find this sort of banding of many many lines across uh, um, stones that have been uh, in some way uh, carrying uranium within them for example a green zircon will have many many bands across it and lastly in terms of uh, spectrums this is a a tacky looking cobalt blue spinel um, you'll see the same spectrum a cobalt spectrum also in cobalt tinted glass uh, it's not hard to find that nor is it hard to find uranium tinted glasses where you can see some interesting spectrums um, but again very unique spectrum for the cobalt tinted spinel so just uh, really to summarize the, the spectroscope along with with the mag light and the little knob from the end of the chair it goes together as a little kit that you can take with you so when you go to a place like for example the gibson property you might decide that hey uh, the real exciting thing i'm looking for is rare earth spectrums in the appetite and you may be looking for all sorts of appetites uh and, and you go through them all and you go okay this one has a really massive spectrum or look i found a zircon it's got a, a uranium spectrum many many dark lines through it right so i mean iron spectrums it, it's a facet of you know gemology and mineral collecting that you can delve right into and find actually is a very interesting pursuit and additionally it helps you identify gemstones that by all appearances a red a red a red hey what is this is it a spinel is it a garnet is it a ruby but you check it out in the spectroscope and right away you go oh it's a spinel or it's a ruby or it's a garnet right so it's a very handy tool and i'll leave you with that thought hopefully the next time you're, you're hearing from me um jeff and i will be out on a, a mineral trip and i hope that's not in the too far distant future because it looks like it's getting lovely and sunny outside